ंड्री Though India lifted 415 million people out of extreme poverty in the past 15 years, the country still has 229 million people living in extreme poverty, more than any other country in the world. That is on less than one dollar ninety cents per day, according to UNDP. Malnutrition, especially among women and children, is also a big problem in India. So, why is India spending precious scarce resources on a space probe? Is it just because the center of right government of Narendra Modi is just looking for things to celebrate and sees rockets and satellites as proxies for national pride or is there a much deeper strategic reason for this let's understand the far reaching implications of the successful launch of Skyroot rocket and how india is planning to dominate this soon to be 1 trillion dollar global space industry The story of the Indian space program is a very inspiring one. To appreciate how visionary and forward thinking it is, we need to understand how poor India was in 1947 at the time of its independence. When the British colonized India in the 17th century, India's GDP was between 25 and 35 percent of the world's total GDP. When they left after independence in 1947, India's GDP has dropped to only two percent. In 1947 agriculture was 54% of its GDP and 80% of the population was below the poverty line less than a sixth of indians were literate and most of the socio economic indicators were abysmal after hundreds of years of slavery and exploitation india was so weak and divided in 1947 that many people thought the nation would not survive and would break up Having an independent space program of its own was almost unthinkable but thanks to great visionaries India saw space technology as a means to leapfrog national development and nation building Dr Vikram Sarabha is considered the father of the Indian space program After the launch of Sputnik in 1957 he recognized the potential that satellites provided The proximity between visionaries like Dr Vikram Sarabha and Dr Homi Baba and the first Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru who also saw scientific development as an essential part of India's future fastened the process of decision making in outer space. Unlike the United States and the Soviet Union which were then locked in a mutual cold war and were focused on human space exploration India was focused on domestic economic applications of space technology it wanted to use space for things like mapping and surveying crops assessing damage from natural disasters and erosion and rural connectivity Though modern space research in India can be traced to the 1920s when scientists like K Mitra C V Raman Meghdad Saha conducted experiments Indian space research got institutionalized in 1969 when ISRO was founded under the chairmanship of Dr Vikram Sarabhai The state run ISRO sent up rockets in the early 60s satellite launches began in 1975 and a probe went to the moon in 2008 ISRO's reputation for low-cost space research was cemented in 2013 when another probe was dispatched to Mars for 73 million dollars, less than the budget of the movie Gravity, starring Sandra Bullock and George Clooney about a doomed space mission. It was released at about the same time actually. India was the fourth country to do this after United States, Russia, first as Soviet Union and the European Space Agency and the only country to do it on its first try. 
In contrast, NASA's most recent Mars orbiter, MAVEN, loaded with cutting-edge scientific instruments and launched in 2013, cost $671 million, almost 10 times as much. ISRO, like NASA, is essentially a scientific organization whose principal objective is exploration of space and carrying out scientific missions like sending a human to the moon. But right now, too much of ISRO's resources are consumed by routine activities like launching weather or communication satellites. The world over, an increasing number of private players are taking over this kind of activity for commercial benefits. Additionally, the demand for space-based applications and services is also growing even within India, and ISRO cannot meet it. So to free itself and take advantage of the rapidly growing global space economy, which according to the City Group will grow to $1 trillion by 2040, the Indian government took some historic steps in 2020. It launched a new organization called InSpace to share ISRO's research, technology, facilities and even experienced former employees with private companies in India. Let's look at both the global space industry and the private companies operating in the space industry in India. First, the global space industry. Until recently, the space industry has been dominated by government-sponsored programs which focused more on military capability and creating revenue and jobs. As more private companies enter the industry, they are prioritizing operational efficiency. According to projections by Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Citigroup and others, the global space industry could generate a revenue of $1 trillion or more in 2014 up from about 390 billion currently. One of the biggest reasons for this rapid growth is the decrease in launch costs brought about by reusable rockets. NASA's Artemis program, which plans to return astronauts to the lunar surface, is expected to cost about $2 billion per launch. By contrast, Falcon 9, the rocket built by Elon Musk's SpaceX, costs about $68 million per launch or approximately $1,500 per kilogram, which is 30 times less than NASA's Artemis. This is because the first of its two stages is reusable, once refurbished and refueled, spreading their construction costs over many launches. The second stage, however, which ends up much higher and moves at much greater speeds, is not yet reusable. SpaceX is now working on changing that with its new Starship rocket that will be completely reusable, bringing down launching costs even further to $10 million a ride. India's Skyroot believes it will be able to deliver basic payloads at the same price as the likes of SpaceX, and for custom jobs, at half the going rate charged elsewhere by using new manufacturing processes. A typical rocket has three parts, first stage, second stage, and the payload. The first stage is the section as the bottom of the rocket stack containing the main engines that lift the rocket off launch pad. It is usually not powerful enough to carry the payload all the way into the orbit by itself, so at least one additional stage is needed. The second stage takes over once the first stage has been discarded. The thinner air offers less resistance at that altitude when the second stage kicks in, so the engines at this stage do not need to be as powerful as the first stage. The payload is the cargo being carried into the space, whether a satellite, telescope, supplies or even crew. Pairing is used to protect the payload during the early portion of the boost phase, when the aerodynamic forces could affect the rocket. Currently, only the first stage of the rocket is reusable. The second stage and the fairing are not. Trevor Paglin, an American artist, launched a satellite in 2019 solely for artistic purposes. It was a 100 feet reflective structure that will shine down on Earth like an artificial star, visible to the naked eye. It took 10 years and one and a half million dollars to make. It's a different matter that it failed because of the US government shutdown over rising the US debt ceiling. Prolonged radio silence from Earth meant that engineers missed the window to complete the deployment of the work. But this is an indicator of the exciting new world where everyone has access to low-cost satellites, not just governments of big countries. Which is why there has been a sudden increase in the number of satellites launched since 2017. The global space industry, currently valued at $390 billion, is broadly divided into satellite-related and government space budgets. 
Satellite related makes up about three fourths of the space industry and is mostly run by the private sector. There are broadly three types of human made satellites depending upon how far they are from Earth Geo, Mio, and Leo. Geo or Geosynchronous Equatorial Orbit Satellite are placed at a height of 35,786 kilometers or above, or about 22,000 miles above Earth. Geo satellites weigh the heaviest at about 3 to 4 tons apiece and have a latency of 200 to 400 milliseconds. So they have a delay of about half a second before the message reaches Earth because of the large distances. This is why they are used for purposes where delays do not matter, like satellite radio and television and weather forecasting. MEO or medium Earth orbit satellites are between 2000 and 35,786 kilometers. And their best known use is for GPS purposes. Google Maps, for instance, relies on MEO satellites. But it is LEO satellites where most of the innovation is happening. LEO satellites are the closest to Earth anywhere between 160 kilometers and 2000 kilometers. They are also the smallest, sometimes as small as 64 grams. For instance, in 2017, NASA launched Kalamsat, the smallest satellite ever, designed by an Indian student and named after APJ Abdul Kalam of India. LEO satellites can bring internet connectivity to places where it is still unavailable or unaffordable without any delay because they are much closer to the Earth. Currently, only 60% of world's population has access to internet. That means between 3 billion and 3.5 billion people are still with no internet access at all. The number without access to high-speed or broadband service is even higher. There will also be an enduring source of new demand from the space economy, from autonomous cars, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, virtual reality and video. The satellite related market I explained about is further divided into four segments. Satellite services like broadcasting and internet services, ground equipment like chipsets, satellite manufacturing and launch services like that of India, Skyroot and ISRO and of course SpaceX. Of the $280 billion global satellite related industry, Indian space economy makes up about $10 billion, only about 2% of the global total. So obviously India has a long way to go. Also SpaceX is now working on Starship which is capable of carrying a load of 150 tons per ride. For comparison, ISRO's best rocket LVM-3 can carry a payload of up to 10 tons and Skyroot's Vikram-1 a payload of 290 kilos. India, it's no superpower yet in space. But the country has a lot of potential that was a long time in the making. ISRO has been transferring technologies to small and and medium enterprises over the past four decades. As a result, India currently has over 500 suppliers of various technologically advanced components. Thanks to change in government policy and the creation of InSpace to further incubate technologies into the private firms, the private space industry in India is all set to take off and take advantage of the rapidly growing global demand. Already InSpace has received a cascade of applications from eager participants. 68 firms hope to manufacture payloads, another 30 intend to make rockets and components, and 57 more want to develop ground stations or exploit space-derived data, from monitoring steel production to locate shoals of fish at sea. All of these new forms of imaging generate enormous volumes of data, terabytes a day, enough that getting it down to ground for processing becomes its own problem. It's good that India has globally recognized expertise in software and data analysis that can be tapped at a low cost. India currently has several notable startups in the space industry. The company behind the recent successful launch, Skyroot Aerospace, was founded in the South Indian city of Hyderabad by Pawan Chandana and Naga Dhaka, former engineers in the Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO. Skyroot was the first company to sign an agreement with ISRO to launch rockets. It recently raised a Series B financing of $51 million from Singapore's GIC, Government Investment Corporation, increasing the company's total funding to $68 million so far. Pixel is a Bangalore-based startup founded by Aweis Ahmed and Kshitij Khandelwal while still in college in 2019. It recently launched its second satellite Shakuntala that should provide detailed images of Earth. 
after its recent round of funding of $25 million from Canadian firm Radical Ventures, the company's total fundraise has raised to $33 million so far. Dhruva is another satellite startup based out of Hyderabad. The 10-year-old startup, co-founded by Sanjay Nekanti and three others, makes satellite infrastructure and platforms, but not the actual payloads. So, for instance, the payload for the Pixel satellite I mentioned above would be a special camera. Dhruva would manufacture satellite infrastructure such as solar panels, satellite software, communication systems and satellite deployers on which any payload can be mounted. The company has raised $8 million so far. Chennai-based Agnikul raised $20 million and hopes to dispense with conventional launch sites, replacing them with cheaper mobile pads. As of now, most of India's rockets are launched from Sriharikota, a place near Chennai. If Agnikul succeeds, then rockets could be launched from anywhere. Some of the other notable startups in India include Bellatrix Aerospace, Satcher, Astrogate Labs, Satellize, and Manastu Space. India's space program did not begin with big ambitions. Vikram Sarabhai, the father of the Indian space program, said that India did not have the fantasy of competing with the economically advanced nations in the exploration of the moon or planets or manned space flights. He wanted to apply advanced space technology to the real problems of man and society. India used space as a means to leapfrog economic development and nation building. But things seem to have changed now. India is sending exploratory missions to the moon and Mars, some of which are manned. Now that the private industry is increasingly assuming the responsibility of enabling social and economic development, does it still make sense for the Indian government to invest scarce resources on space instead of poverty elevation? I think the answer is yes. Unlike America, which is surrounded by vast oceans and super nice and cooperative neighbors like Canada and Mexico, India does not live in a benign neighborhood. Countries like Pakistan and China surround it, whose relationship with India is very complicated at best. So investing in space exploration is a national security imperative for India. The Indian security establishment and the larger Indian strategic community woke up to this reality in January 2007, when China successfully tested an anti-satellite missile. It highlighted the China threat and the consequences of engaging in the militarization and weaponization of space. Because until then, countries used space only for so-called passive military applications, such as communication and spying, but not anymore. You can now actually blow up the satellites of other countries. Besides helping increase the visibility and profile of the Indian space program, missions to Mars, the Moon and even the Sun will help the Indian government develop the capabilities necessary to defend its space assets from possible Chinese attacks. Moreover, as and when the world agrees on global rules to govern outer space, these advanced space capabilities will give India a bigger seat and a louder and more credible voice at the table. So even though missions to Mars and Moon may not have a direct developmental or social benefit, it makes sense for the Indian government to invest in them. In 2014, India surprised everyone when it successfully launched an unmanned spacecraft Mangalyaan to Mars at a cost of $74 million, a fraction of the $671 million spent by NASA on a similar Mars mission, and far cheaper than the budget of the Hollywood movie Gravity. India could keep the cost so low because, besides an obsessive focus on finishing on time and within budget, the country sources most of the critical components and materials indigenously. It does not rely on expensive imports. The extensive network of private companies that ISRO has cultivated over the past four decades through technology transfers makes that possible. Cost of talent is also much lower in India. The annual salary of an aeronautical engineer in the United States is just under $105,000, whereas in India, an engineer of similar caliber costs less than $20,000. And there are a lot of talented engineers in India to choose from. 
Finally, India has a large startup ecosystem, the third largest after US and China, to help create and nurture new startups in the space industry. All this, when combined with a large number of engineering graduates India produces every year and its proven software development prowess, gives the country an immense advantage in the rapidly growing global space industry. The success of Skyroot Aerospace is a major milestone for India, but the country that is soon to be the most populous in the world is just getting started. If you like this video, it's very likely you'll like this one. Subscriptions really help with the YouTube algorithm and in promoting the channel. So please consider subscribing. I'm Sharat Mantravadi. Thanks for watching.